Whether they're turning up the volume on a playlist or asking a search engine about current events, many people are not familiar with using cloud-based technologies for hands-free tasks in their daily lives. In the research realm, cloud-based systems provide scientists with remotely controlled equipment, allowing experimental breakthroughs from any location with computer access. Remote labs and cloud-connected instruments are revolutionizing the way researchers approach bench work, improving scientific discovery and education by enabling accessible and automated workflows. Welcome to The Scientist Speaks, a podcast produced by the Scientist Creative Services team. Our podcast is by scientists and for scientists. Once a month, we bring you the stories behind newsworthy molecular biology research. In this month's episode, Deanna McNeil from the Scientist Creative Services team spoke with Mohamed Mostaha Raji from the University of California, Santa Cruz, Brandon Sutherland from University of Toronto's Accelerated Consortium, and Dana Cortat from Align to Innovate to learn about connecting experiments to the cloud in the current era of remote research technologies. Scientists typically depend on physically accessible laboratory infrastructure and equipment to perform experiments. As technology advances and researchers' areas of expertise broaden, the lab of the present is beginning to resemble the lab of the future more closely, with instruments moving beyond manual operation and into the realm of automation and remote control. Cloud-based platforms empower the ever-popular shift toward laboratory automation, sometimes at the level of individual lab-owned instruments or in communal lab spaces, such as core labs, biofoundries, self-driving labs, and cloud labs. In the past 20 years, remote research has become more and more commonplace, especially for science and engineering education. Whether the learning environment is a lab or a classroom, education is at the core of scientific discovery. But not all academic environments are created equal. Access to reagents, equipment, and laboratory training are common barriers in STEM education and researchers like Mohamed Mustaho Raji use cloud technologies to overcome these obstacles. Mustaho Raji is an assistant research scientist at the Genomics Institute of University of California, Santa Cruz. Along with his colleagues at UCSC, who engineer automated lab technologies, his team combines existing cloud-based servers with in-lab techniques, such as cell culture, microscopy, and brain organoid electrophysiology to implement remote project-based education programs. We develop low-cost technologies, meaning either 3D printed or off-the-shelf materials, that enables us to take tissue culture and put it on the cloud. This can be microscopy, it can be electrophysiology, it can be fluidics. We develop this technology in the context of research as part of a consortium called the Brain Engineers. When the pandemic hit, we realized that our technology could be applied now in the education setting. My background is on neuroscience, but I also used to do a lot of nonprofit work in, in STEM education in Hispanic populations, primarily in Latin America. What we have focused on recently is to try to bring science education and project-based learning specifically to underserved populations throughout the United States and the world, with a particular focus on students who otherwise would have not have access to experimental education. Accessible science education accounts for factors such as internet speed, equipment costs, and material availability. Learning from past experiences working with students in the Amazon and the Andes, where internet access was not always quick enough for lab-made servers, Mustaho Raji's team began using adaptive technologies that already exist. They piggyback onto cloud servers that enable basic live streaming, so that students can remotely observe experiments in real time, even in settings with low internet connectivity. The researchers work alongside teachers and students who design their own projects based off of their interests, such as screening molecular compounds with neuronal cell cultures. Mustaho Raji's team cultures the neurons. The students make extracts from supplements found at the closest pharmacy. And after the research team applies the extracts to the cells, microscopes transmit live cell imaging to the students through streaming servers. The students observe the cultures, analyze the data, and present their findings at the end of the experiment. This semi-remote approach enables student-driven experiments in classrooms that may not otherwise have access to research materials such as cell culture equipment or microscopes. It also facilitates cross-disciplinary education that often leads to creative research questions, 
such as investigating how electrical cues from music influence connections in the brain. We have worked with electrophysiology, and that has been particularly interesting because it allows us to reach students who are normally not in the biological fields, such as computer science and mathematics. We have worked with a classroom very recently, having students put brain organoids into high-density multi-electrode arrays and having them code a simulation patterns to then analyze how the different simulation patterns affect the short-term and long-term plasticity of the neuronal network. That, to me, was a fascinating experiment. It was, again, driven a lot of it by the students. We just told them they can do any the stimulation pattern they want. And they came up with some very, very creative ideas. For example, some of them actually tried to encode songs, well-known symphonies, as well as some traditional African songs into the organoid. So we use these multi-electrode arrays that have over 26,000 electrodes. Once you put an organoid on, on top of this MEA, you basically get three to four electrodes per neuron in the surface of the organoid. The interesting part is that you can take any 32 of the electrodes and convert them into simulation electrodes. The students basically try to code the song itself but try each of the instruments as one of the electrodes. Just wanted to see how the circuit would change in their mathematics students. So they were looking now at like probability of, of synapses between different neurons. Again, I thought it was a very smart idea. I was a little bit skeptical at the beginning, so I was surprised when they actually saw differences between the different frequencies. But again, these are very, very early days. This was the very first time we tried this. The creativity behind these experiments is enabled both by remote access to research technologies in the classroom and by support of social factors. With the help of the cloud and motivated teachers, high school students get to ask and investigate scientific questions that do not necessarily have known answers. Mustaho Raji believes that this scientific experience, as well as the students' familiarity with the concept of the cloud, contributes to the success of project-based science education. Although the COVID pandemic brought the need for remote science education tools into sharp focus for Mustaho Raji's current work, he acknowledges that cloud-based alternatives to hands-on experiments are far from new concepts. Today, academic scientists develop interdisciplinary research technologies themselves, or they outsource their experiments to commercial remote lab spaces, such as cloud labs, which have a broader scope of instruments than a conventional research lab and enable fully remote applications. We have not invented cloud laboratories in any way. I would say that the companies came well before us. My thought is that they're both really, really good approaches. It depends on what the purpose is. For us, it's all about scale. It's all about reaching communities, but it's also all about sharing the technology. We have established the Live Cell Biotechnology Discovery Lab, which we believe is becoming a very interesting maker space, bringing together engineers, biologists, and social scientists to think about not only developing the technology, but also how do we use the technologies in a true pedagogical setting and how to make research that is also impactful both for education as well for the social sciences. The promise of cloud-based research to improve accessible scientific discovery extends beyond the classroom. Remote lab spaces such as cloud labs, biofoundries, and self-driving laboratories are increasingly making waves in commercial and academic contexts with potential to both democratize and accelerate the scientific process. At the University of Toronto, self-driving labs bring together academic, industry, and government research projects to expedite discoveries across life science, chemistry, and material science disciplines. Brandon Sutherland is the Director of Research Operations at the Acceleration Consortium, or AC, which is the University of Toronto's hub for remote automated research. As a society, a lot of our grandstanding challenges are material space challenges. The idea that we just need better materials. This can be new light absorbing materials for better solar cells, new battery electrodes for longer lasting electric vehicles, or new organic small molecules that could be the next generation of cancer treatment drugs. The AC is built around this vision. We do this using something called self-driving labs. 
we've combined material science with the power of artificial intelligence, robotics, high performance computing, and all of this is put together in a way that allows us to reduce the time and cost to bring new material to market. Conventional material discovery labs usually start with data sets, scientific knowledge, and human intuition to identify and synthesize compounds. This process, and the subsequent in-lab testing needed to characterize new materials, is often slow and costly, yielding just a few hits from massive starting pools of candidates. Sutherland and the AC envisioned the future of scientific discovery, moving more and more towards AI and robotics as self-driving solutions to these challenges. We start by amassing large amounts of data from existing literature, online databases, or through our own data generation. We then train machine learning models to learn from this data to then suggest a target number of materials or molecules that might be useful for a given application. We use a bunch of robots to go and synthesize these materials, more robots to characterize them in high throughput. And then we use AI again to learn trends from that from these experiments. Data trends identified by AI can inform the next generation of experiments needed in a workflow. And then the process can begin again in an automated fashion. This is the model that scientists involved with the AC are pursuing for remote research and self-driving labs. The AC is in its early stages, setting up the infrastructure and connecting with researchers. Sutherland highlights that building these spaces for academic applications can be a challenge, in part because there are few blueprints for self-driving labs and their applications, with only a handful currently operating worldwide. Still, an international cohort of self-driving labs, connected by the cloud, already have some success stories under their belt. For example, six self-driving labs across Canada, the U.S., Poland, Scotland, and Japan use cloud infrastructure to asynchronously optimize and synthesize new organic light-emitting small molecules for modern display technologies like smartphones. So we have this delocalized series of labs that transfer all the information in real time between all the labs through a cloud. They spent some time and money to set up the infrastructure to synthesize and characterize the properties of these organic emitters. After conducting a few hundreds of early experiments, they've gotten that base data set that they can start to train AI models on. And once they had that running, the next about 200 experiments or so, they were able to discover 15 materials that improved upon the state of art. Every new experiment run of these labs and produce new organic emitting materials that improve upon the state of art. This delocalized series of labs rapidly tackled this problem together. This delocalized coalition of self-driving labs highlights another benefit of remote research technologies, shared infrastructure. Just as each classroom or teaching lab might not be equipped with every possible resource, research facilities face challenges related to funding, instrument availability, and operating expertise. One goal of the AC is to build self-driving user facilities that bypass these differences, similar to a cloud lab where researchers can remotely request and perform experiments that they may not have direct access to in their local environment. The goal here is not just to improve the quality, speed, and cost, but also to help level the discovery playing field. You can have a self-driving lab that just sits somewhere and it's used by the individuals in that lab space versus a self-driving lab that is a user facility where individuals around the world or within a country can go and request experiments. What we're trying to build out will be more cloud lab-like. As you move more and more towards these cloud lab-like facilities, you know, if, if you're a researcher in a country that may not be as well-funded, for example, as say, big labs in the US, I think it'll reward researchers with the right ideas that ask the right scientific questions and it'll be less rewarding to the, just the researchers that can amass the most amount of equipment and infrastructure. I think it's a great step towards democratizing science globally. Cloud labs can be thought of as a category of remote research facilities, much like self-driving laboratories. However, in the biotechnology sphere, the Cloud Lab concept has become nearly synonymous with one specific entity, Emerald Cloud Lab, or ECL. 
This remotely operated research facility has a unique startup story, growing from antiviral therapeutic research into a fully fledged service model laboratory that runs on computer code and hundreds of cloud connected instruments. Among its many applications and services, ECL partners with a nonprofit initiative called Align to Innovate, which financially and logistically supports scientists seeking to build and test automated methods. Dana Cortad is a technical project manager at Align to Innovate, who leads and coordinates programs such as a bioautomation grant program called The Challenge, which helps academic researchers overcome barriers that commonly hinder the transition of hands-on projects into cloud-based ones. There's this landscape of what we actually call a cloud lab at the moment. But I think that right now the main users are mostly these like industry folks who have access to it. Our bioautomation challenge originally started in 2022. It was the idea of our founder, Erica de Benedictus. She's now a PI at the Francis Crick Institute. But throughout her work, um, she saw the need to increase reproducibility and she saw the power of working with automation, how that could go hand in hand to make high throughput data sets to be able to do uh, more modeling and generation of new proteins and new systems. When she learned about Emerald Cloud Labs, so she learned about cloud labs in general, she realized that there was this barrier for academics to be able to justify using their services because double dipping into your own capital equipment and going out and paying for something on the cloud lab. It seemed like it was kind of this hard thing to do for a lot of academic groups. She uh, was able to develop this grant program and onboard several different academic labs. The whole point of that challenge was to be able to have people uh, have certain amount of funding time to be able to transition one of their active programs or active projects into the cloud lab system and generate some proof points to be able to then search for that larger grant funding from other institutions. It's really exciting because these labs um, not only can use the same machines and systems and protocols that they had in their own labs, but they can also access other equipment that they might not have had any access to even in their core facilities. Beyond funding and equipment access, Cortad's work on the challenge includes recruiting individual contributors to develop pipelines of code that instruct a wide range of scientific protocols on the ECL platform. These pipelines lower energy barriers to cloud-based methods for researchers who are just getting started with remote and automated systems. Align to Innovate also operates several other programs, including the tournament and the datasets, which work independently but also feed into one another. Synergizing aligns efforts to make cloud-based research a reality for more academic scientists. The challenge program, which is the bioautomation challenge, that's interacting with cloud labs and developing uh, open source protocols for life science pipelines, protein engineering pipelines. Our second program, um, the protein engineering tournament, is similar to CASP, which was the tournament that enabled AlphaFold to be created. The form of the tournament is actually in two stages. We have an in silico part of the tournament where we've given data to teams and had them use their methods to predict um, properties from sequences. Then we picked the best teams and put them into an in vitro round where the teams got more data and we asked them to predict even better sequences. We're currently uh, actually experimentally uh, expressing them, uh, bringing them into the lab, and we're going to be characterizing them and deciding the winner uh, by experimentation, which is pretty exciting. Our third program is the Open Datasets Initiative. And with this, our goal is to be able to ask scientists uh, around the world what new data sets they need to be able to generate these really amazing uh, machine learning predictive models. We've been interviewing people and making workshops and bringing together uh, like-minded scientists to work out proposals around things like uh, sequence to expression data sets or sequence to function data sets. Within the next two years, we have the funding to be able to generate two to three of these very large data sets um, and give them and their protocols all open sourced to the public. Open access resources like data sets and protocols are critical for expanding the realm of remote research into the academic setting. It's a common thread among Align's programs. The challenge produces open source protocols and code for cloud-based experiments. The in vitro portion of the tournament will generate shareable data from open protocols using cloud platforms. And the Datasets Initiative will create large-scale living datasets that anyone can access. 
As more labs gain access to cloud-based and automated methods, whether within their own labs, in core facilities, or through commercial entities like cloud labs, scientists will also need to understand how to interact with and program new computational technologies. This may be an added barrier in the life sciences, where hands-on experiments that do not require computer science training are still the bread and butter in most labs. Telling a robot how to pipette liquid from one tube into another, for example, is not as intuitive as moving your arm between samples. Researchers need to speak computer-based languages and reimagine experimental design through a computational lens, which are additional aspects of remote research that are improved by open source approaches. That's something that these companies are working on, but also we're seeing communities popping up to have shared protocols, being able to show uh, shared scripts for controlling these different devices. That's really letting scientists who are approaching this for the first time engage in this kind of science, high throughput science, automated science from the get-go. It's incredible to see how this is going to change how we do science and how we think about science. When we're talking about people accessing the equipment, it's not going to be the old structure of people going in and learning from the basics with these machines, how to calibrate them, how to keep them up and running, how to interact with them in a core facility. Instead, uh, you'll be able to see a couple of lines of code that help you control something as complicated as an HPLC. You can have somebody do an HPLC run just as, as a test the first time that they access this cloud lab. I think that uh, the way that we think about what kinds of experiments we can do will change, and the types of experiments you'll see within a single lab will change. The groundwork for these changes now exists in the form of cloud-connected instruments. But of course, there are still growing pains that accompany this expanding field. Whether it's in the classroom or the research lab, Cortad, Sutherland, and Mustaho Raji all highlight specific speed bumps that slow the progress of remote research in academic settings. Cost and facing the learning curve of new technology. It's a risk to move towards the unknown. But risks also hold opportunity, a concept that scientists are known to embrace. It's like us these days using a thermocycler or any other piece of equipment. If you go back 20 years, People had to have a lot of different types of knowledge to be able to control the electrical components or build it to be able to do the cycles they actually wanted. And now scientists can go and have very deep knowledge in another area and use just the basic user input for the thermocycler. I think that's the same transition we're going to be seeing with all of this lab automation. We're just going to get really deep in other areas of science and other knowledge areas. Thank you for listening to The Scientist Speaks. This episode was produced by the Creative Services Team for The Scientist and narrated by Deanna McNeil. Please join us again in February as we learn how researchers use CRISPR-based tools for epigenetic editing. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on social media and subscribe to The Scientist Speaks wherever you get your podcasts.